in this video, we are going to talk about sets. In other words, we're going to talk about the concept of sets in mathematics. So the, the first question is, what's a set? A set is a collection of objects that belong to the same class. So think about it this way. When you say you have a set of objects, the first thing you want to define is the class of that of, of those objects. So class of objects, right? That's the first thing you need to define. Then when you've got the class of those objects, the, the, the set becomes the collection of all the objects that belongs to that particular class. So let's take a look at this example. If I ask you list all the vowels in the English language, now we've got a I A E I O U, right? So these are the vowels. So if you think about it carefully, you realize that vowels represent the class, right? That's the name of the class to which all these letters belong to. So a set is a collection of objects that belong to a given class. So let's list another example. If I ask you to list the first five prime numbers, so what do I mean by that? The first thing is to identify the class. We are talking about prime numbers, right? Prime numbers. So what are the elements or objects on the prime numbers? But this time around, we are interested in the first five. So prime numbers include two, three, five, seven, and 11. So these are the first five prime numbers that we have. So you can see that a set is a collection of elements. We call each of these elements a collection of elements that belong to the same class. So that's what a set is. So you could have a set of anything. For example, if you think about footballers, the, the, the individuals that, con that constitute a team in a football a team, they are, they are elements in a set of football team. So we, so we can have a set of anything. As long as they belong to the same class, those elements belong to a set. So that's what a set is all about. Now, the next thing I would like you to understand about sets is the way we list out or the way we express set in mathematics is as follows. You, you we use curly brackets. This is a curly bracket to represent a collection of elements. So if I ask you, okay, list, um, give me a set of odd numbers, the first three odd numbers. You are going to have this curly bracket and then you list the odd numbers, right? So this is how you represent sets in mathematics. You call it, you call it brackets with all the elements inside. The other thing is how, how are set typically uh, stated in mathematics? A set could be provided as a collection of all its elements. For example, I could just list one, three, five as, as the set. Or sometimes a set could be provided as a, in a descriptive fashion where you'll be told that X, that this is a set of X, where X is odd numbers. So in this particular scenario, the set is not, the set is provided as a description. So the, 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 the listing, the, the set was not provided in such a way that the elements um, were listed. The set was provided as a description. So sometimes it could also be stated without a curly bracket. Sometimes you could have a question telling you that, oh, you have a set of, a set of positive integers. So this could also be a way by which is, by which a set could be described. 
So, but then if you want to express it as a collection of elements, then you use the curly bracket to express it as follows. The set of positive integers include one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So that is what a set is uh, all about. So I'm going to talk about the various type of set that we have, and I'm also going to talk in details about the properties of set and the operations that can be carried out on set. Now let's talk about the types of set. So let's go through the various types of sets. One, we have universal set. What is a universal set? A universal set is a set that contains all the possible elements under consideration. Now, what I mean by under consideration is this. Universal set is, a, is subjective. What that means is, if I'm talking about numbers, if I'm interested in numbers, then my universal set will be with respect to numbers. If I'm talking about, let's say, letters, English letter, for instance, my universal set would be related to that. So universal set is not something that applies to every type of set. It applies to the subject matter you are interested in. So if, for example, I'm interested in numbers, then my universal set could be a set of all possible real numbers, right? That would be my universal set. But then let's say I'm interested in Integers. I'm not interested in all possible numbers. All possible numbers include decimals and so on. But let's say I'm only interested in whole numbers, integers. Then my universal set could be a collection of all integers. Then if, for example, my topic of consideration is purely positive integers, then I could make my universal set that. So the point is, universal set is simply a set of all possible elements under consideration. So if I'm, if for example, I'm dealing with um, a subject, a subject matter involving high school students, for instance, my universal set could, could, could represent the whole of the, the, the a collection of whole high school students in a given environment. And my universal set could also be a collection of students in a particular class, if I'm just talking about a particular class. So don't mistake universal set as a set of all the possible things that could ever exist. It's just a set of all possible sets under consideration. We typically represent the symbol for universal set is commonly represented as U, but then there are other representations, but this is one of the common symbols for universal set. So let's talk about another set. Another set we're going to talk about is empty set. So what is an empty set? An empty set is a set with no element. That's what it is. So what does that mean? It means an empty set has no element. So if you have a classroom with no students, then that classroom is an empty set. So that is basically what an empty set is. So how do we denote an empty set? You denote it with a curly bracket with nothing inside, or you can denote it as a zero that is crossed. So these are the two possible ways you could denote an empty set. Number three, we are going to talk about subsets. So what is a subset? So the first thing is to state subset is, is, is a kind of set you, 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 you describe with respect to another set. So let me give this illustration. So let's say I have A. A is a collection of odd numbers. So let's say we have 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. So let me stop here, right? Then let's say our universal set is just a collection of numbers from 1 to from 1 to 10, right? So let's say these are universal sets. We're just dealing with numbers from 1 to 10. So let's say in this case, I gave you another set, which is set B. And set B is odd numbers that are prime numbers. So odd numbers that are prime numbers, they are as follows. So now this is set B. Now we can 
if you think about it carefully, you will notice that, or if you look at what I've just done, you notice that all the elements in B can be found in A, right? 3 is in B, 3 is in A, 5 is in B, 5 is in A, and so on. But then A has more than B, but all of B can be found in A. So what do we call this? We say B is a subset of A. So when you say a given set is a subset of another set, what you are saying is all of the elements in that given set can be found in the other set you are referencing. So B is a subset of A. If all the elements in B can be found in A, that is what a subset is all about. But then we have two types of subset because there could be two scenarios. There could be a scenario where they're exactly the same. So let's say I give you another set C, which is exactly the same as which is exactly the same as A, right? So A and C they're exactly the same. In this case, technically speaking, C is also a subset of A because all of C can be found in A. But how can we distinguish between these two? So I'm going to explain two types of subset that we have. We have what we call a proper subset. So in the case of A and B, B is a proper subset. So this is how we denote a subset. It looks like a less than symbol. You know, less than means something is B is less than A, right? So this is how you can remember B is less than A. But we don't use the exact less than. We use a, a kind of um, inverted C that looks like a less than. So this is a proper subset. So we say B is a proper subset of A. If all of B can be found in A, but then all of A can be found in B. That is, there are some elements in A that are not in B. So that's a proper subset. Then we have an improper subset. You now, as the name implies, improper means it's not really a subset. Just like you are equal to that person, but you are not really subordinate to that person. So it's an improper subset. So in the case of C, C is an improper subset of A. So in that case, we add what we call equal to. So what this means is C is a subset of A, but it's also equal to A. So meaning that it is less than or equal to A, basically. Just think about it that way. So it's an improper subset. So that is subset. So now let's talk about another type of set known as superset. So we have superset. A superset is almost like the opposite of a subset. So a superset is a set that has other elements in it. So let's take a look at what that means. A superset. So let's say we are using the same example as as we had earlier. So here we have one, three, seven, one, three, five, seven, nine. Then B is one is three, five, seven. Now if B is a subset of A, then A is a superset of B. So superset can be seen as greater than. So superset is basically a set that has all of the elements of what you are referencing. So if I say A is superset of B, what I mean is A has all of B and has more, right? Or may have more. So A has all of B. So is, you can picture it this way. If you say you are superior to someone, it means you have you have you've got everything that other one has and possibly you have more so but then we have two type of superset just like subset we have improper and proper superset because if they are the same so let's say i have c equals to one three five seven nine so if they are the same you say that a is a superset is an improper superset of c because now a is a is um, not just a A is not just uh, a superset, but it's also equal. So that that's what that's the reason why we call this improper superset.
why this is a proper superset. So that's superset. Now let's talk about the next type of set, equal set. Now you say two sets are equal if they have the same element. That is what it means. But then it, it, they may have, okay, this is what I mean. So let's say I have an element, I have a set N, which contains the following. One, two, let's say four and eight. So let's say I have another one, which is um, N. And let's say it has one, two, two, four, eight, eight, right? Now, if you, if you notice, they have the same type of elements, but N has more elements. In the world of set, having more elements does not make you superior to the other, because set is all about how unique, how many unique elements do you have, not necessarily repetitions. So because they have exactly the same type of element, there is one here, there is one here, there is two here, there is two here, it doesn't matter if there are repetitions of two or repetition of eight. As long as the elements you can find here, you can also find them here. And there's no extra. That is, there's no new element here that is not here. There's no new element here that is not here. As a result, we say that M is equal, is equal to N. So they are equal sets. Okay, so let's talk about another set called disjoint set. Disjoint set set now what the, this joint set are set that have nothing in common it's just like the opposite of equal set so if i have a to be something like oh let's list out some odd not some odd numbers one three five and let's say b is um even number two four six because there's nothing in a that you can find in b Nothing in common. They have no elements in common. You say that A and B are this joint set. They've got nothing in common. So these are the types of set that we have. Now, we're going to talk about the properties of a set. So let's talk about that right away. I'm going to talk about two properties of sets. The first is the cardinality, the cardinality of a set. So what is the cardinality of a set? The cardinality of a set is the number of elements in that set. That's simple. So if you have a set given as one, two, three, then four, five. So you can say the cardinality of, a set, of that set, the cardinality the cardinality of set A of set A is equal to 5. It means we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 unique elements. Note the word unique. It means how many unique elements, not repetitions. Even if you have repetitions, they don't, the repetitions don't count. So what I mean by repetition is if I have something like 1, 2, 3, 3, 4, five, six, and six. You don't count repetition, you just count one, two, three, four, five, six. So here the cardinality of set B is six. So this is how you represent cardinality of a set. You, you use N, which is like the number of elements in that set, and you put bracket of that element equals the count which is five so this is how you represent you this is a symbol for expressing the cardinality of the set now let's talk about the power power set power set now what is a power set of a set so because it's a property of a set right so let's look at this example so let's say i have a set a let's say this set a consists of multiples of 10. So let's say 10, 20, 30. Let me just use 10 and 20, right? Now, if I ask what's the power set of set A, mind you, look at the way I express it, the power set, 
of set A because power set is not just an isolated concept, it's a property of a set. Now, power set of set A consists of all the possible subsets you can create from set A. So what that means is, if I ask you what are the possible subsets we can carve out of this set A. Now let's express it. So this is how you express power set P. Then you have your A inside. Now let's list all the possible subsets. We can, the first set could be 10. That is, 10 is a subset of this. In other words, if you have a set, okay, let me explain, express it this way so that you get it clear, in a clearer fashion. So let me remove the outer bracket. So what I, the first thing you do is you, you take each of the elements. So this is 10, right? Then you put it in a set because power set is a, is a collection of sets. So this is a set. Now, which other elements can be a subset of A? 20, just 20 can be a subset of A, right? Then which other element, uh, which other set can we make that is a subset of A? The set itself, this is an improper subset. So this is also a subset of A because when we talked about subset, I made it clear that even though you have a set with the same element, you can still call them subset, but they are improper subset. Okay. Now, what is the fourth possible subset we can carve out? Empty set. Empty set is always a set of any, is always a subset of any set. An empty set is always a subset. What it means is, as long an empty set can be, it is always superior to every other set because an empty set means it has nothing, and because it has nothing, it is it it it, it is superior, it is inferior rather to a given set. So these are the possible sets you can create out of set A. Now, because you are dealing with a set, power set is a set, and for that reason, you put everything inside a curly bracket. So, this is the power set of A. Now, we have what we call the cardinality of power set. The cardinality. Whenever you hear the word cardinality, just know it is simply the number of elements, right? Cardinality of power set. What does that mean? It means the number of elements. In a power set. So if I ask you what's the cardinality of this power set, how many elements is in this power set? We have four, right? So but then I'm going to give you a formula that will help you know the cardinality of any given set. Yet let's imagine you have a set S with n elements. So what is the total number of subset you can create out of it that you can obtain with this formula 2 raised to the power of a where n is the number of elements in set s so that this is a general formula that will help you determine how many subsets you can create out of any given set. So let's look at an example to demonstrate what we just expressed. So let's say I have a set B and set B has the following, right? It has three, five, seven. And now we want to get the power set. First, how many possible subsets can we create out of set B? The formula states that the cardinality of the power set will be 2 raised to the power of n, where n is the number of elements in this set B. So in this case, 3. So what's 2 raised to the power of 3? That's 8. That's 2 times 2 times 2. That's 8. So it means the number of element, the number of subset that we can carve out of this set B will be 8 altogether. So let's see if this is obtainable so the first set we can create is set three subset three so subset three set three is a subset of this larger set so you take the next number which is five right 
Then you take the next number, which is seven. So we've created a subset having just one element. Now the next is to pair them up. So you take three and five, right? Then you take three and seven. Then you take five and seven. So we've done the pairing. Then you take the whole element as a subset. And then the last is an empty set. An empty set is also a subset. Now let's count. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So we've got exactly eight number of subsets. So that's power set. Now we'll talk about operations in set. What are the operations that we can perform on two or more sets or on a, on a given set as well? So let's take a look at that. So the first operation we're going to talk about is the complement. Complement. So given a set, the first thing to explain is to, to take or to determine the complement of a set, you need to know the universal set. Universal set is important. You need to know your universal set before you can determine the complement of a set. So let me just explain with this illustration. So let's say our universal set consists of numbers from 1 to 10, right? And let's say we have set A consisting of odd numbers, I mean prime numbers, from 1 to 10. Now, if I ask you to look to determine the complement, so you can, the complement is expressed as a dash or sometimes as C, a very small C as a, at the top of that set, right? The complement of set A is a set that can be found in the universal set but cannot be found in A. So it's more or less like you saying universal set minus A. Just think about it like this. So you are taking the universal set, subtract A from it, right? If you subtract all the elements in A, it gives you the complement of set A. So if you take away all of these elements from the universal set, you'll be left with 1, 4, 6, 9, 1, 4, you have 6, minus there's, there's 8 here, then this is 8, and this is 10. Okay, so this is a complement of set A. That is it. So, in summary, the complement of a given set is the set of elements in the universal set that can be found in that given set A. So that is what a complement of a set is. So when you perform a complement operation on a set, you are just basically removing all its elements from the universal set. Now let's talk about the next the other property, which is, I mean, operation, which is intercession. Intercession. Okay. What is, what is the intercession of two sets? So in this case, I'm going to list two sets, and I'm going to show you exactly what that means. So let's say we've got two numbers. Uh, a is a collection of prime numbers from 1 to 10. Then B is a collection of odd numbers from odd numbers from 1 to 10. So what then is intercession? Intercession is the set of elements that can be found in both elements at the same in both sets at the same time so what that means is if i say a intercession use this symbol a intercession b what i'm saying is i need to get the element that is common in both a and b and if you think if you look at it closely you'll see that element three 
five, seven. They are the elements common in A and B. So these constitute the intersection of A and B. So let's look at the note that if nothing is common, the answer becomes empty set. So let's say I've got another example. Let's say C. So let's say C is C consists of let's say four and six. And then I ask you what is B intersection C. Now think about it. What are the elements in C and B? If you look, if you think about it, or if you look at it closely, there is nothing. There is nothing in C that you can find in B. So as a result, the answer is an empty set, or you can write it as this. So these are the two ways you write empty set. So there's nothing in common. There's nothing in common. So the answer is an empty set. Okay. So now we talk about the next operation, which is union of two sets. Now let's let's use similar examples. So let's say we've got elements like this. Um, we have prime numbers. Prime numbers as two, three, five, seven. Then let's say set B consists of odd even numbers. So that's two, four, and uh, six, eight, ten. So what is A union B? So this is the symbol for union. What is A union B? A union B is a collection of elements that can be found in both sets without repetition. So take note of that, without repetition. So if you think, if you look at this closely, you see that two can be just, all you are doing basically is you are just aggregating both elements. You are aggregating elements in both sets without repetition. So that's basically what you are doing. So you just, if I, the best way to go about it, just list all the elements of A, which you have as this. Then you can then follow, you can list all the elements of B without repetition. So since two is already here, we are not going to list it. Four is not there, so we just list four. Six is not here, so we list six. Eight is not here, we list eight, then ten. So that's basically how you express union. Just take the first element, then take the second one, add the second one to the list without repetition. That's it. So union of, a, of two sets involve the collection of the elements in both sets without repetition. So now we talk, now we've talked about the common, the three common operations of sets. Now we solve some questions. So we're going to solve some past questions based on what we've learned so far so that we familiarize ourselves with what we've learned. Please note that we are going to be using the Test Julia UTME application to extract real past questions that will help you understand what this concept is all about. It's time to solve some past questions. We're going to extract questions from Test Julia UTME app. Test Julia UTME app is designed for candidates sitting for the JAM UTME exam. And it is an excellent app that has everything you need to ace the exam. So I'm going to use a feature in this app known as this question search to extract questions based on set, uh, of set theory or sets in mathematics. So here's how I'm going to go about it. I'm going to pick mathematics, then I want to search based on topic. And what topic am I interested in sets? So once you do this search, questions should be extracted based on sets. So that's one of the interesting features of this app. You can just extract questions based on a particular topic you are, you, you, you are studying. So now let's solve the first question. The first question we're going to attempt is question six from 2003. So let's take a look at the question. So the question states that U, which happens to be the union set, is equal to even numbers between 0 and 30. So we have even numbers between 0 and 30. So even numbers between 0 
and 30, right? Then P multiples of 6 between 0 and 30, and Q multiples of 4 between 0 and 30. So the question is, we should find P union Q complements, right? So this is the question. So the first thing is to figure out, to solve this question, you need to get the union of P. The, you need to get P union Q. So we talked about union. That's a, the union is a collection of all the elements in P and Q without repetition. So let's look at the question. So P is multiples of 6, right? Which we can easily express as follows. We can easily express P as follows. Multiple of 6 between 0 and 30, that's 6. Then the next is 12. Then 18, that's multiple of 6, right? Then 24. And the last is 30. Then Q is uh, multiple of 4 between 0 and 30, between 0 and 30. So that means we have 4. Then, although you can have, um, 0 is also a multiple of, of P because 6 times 0, we give you 0. So we can include 0 as part of the multiple. So here we have 0, then followed by 4, then followed by 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, and that is it. So these are the multiples of 4. So now what is P union Q? So as I said earlier, to get P union Q, you can simply take all of, you can simply take everything in P and just replicate. You can just simply take everything in P, which is this, and then take whatever you have in Q without repetition. So since we've got zero already, we're not going to include that. Four is not there, so we include four. Eight is not there. Twelve is already there. Sixteen is not. Twenty is not. Twenty-four exists. Then lastly, twenty-eight. So this is P union Q. So what then is P union Q complement? So I, I said earlier in a, in, a, in our lecture that complement is whatever you've got in the unions in the union set or universal set rather that can be found in that set so what we're going to do basically is to remove all of this from the union set from the universal set rather and write whatever is left so let's remove if you remove all of this from the universal set what are you going to be left with so well what i'm going to be left with is numbers even numbers from zero to 30 that can be found here so if you think about it you will notice that 2 is one of even numbers from 0 to 30 but that we can't find here then followed by we can't write 4 4 is here right then 6 is here then the next is 8 we have 8 then what was the next even number 10? So we don't have 10 here. So you write 10. Then the next is 12. 12 is here. Followed by 14. We don't have 14 here. So 14 is part of the complement. Then 16. 16 is here. Then 18 is here. 20 is here. Then 22. There's no 22 here. Right? Then the next is 24. There's 24. Then 26 is the next. If you check, there's no 26. Then the next is 28, which we have here, and 30. So what this means is these are the complements, the complement of this union. And that is the answer. So the correct option here will be the option with 2, 10, 14, 22, and 26. And that makes op option B to be the correct option. So let's look at another question. So the other question, the next question will be question 10 from 2005. So the question goes as follows. If 
u, which happens to be the universal set, is a, is a set of positive integer less than 10. So what that statement means is, whenever you see a question telling you something like x, blah, 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 what that means is that they are expressing the set, they, they are describing the set. So if you want to write it out in full, each of the elements in full, then you interpret that description. So the description states that x is a positive integer less than 10. So positive integer less than 10, we could start from, this is positive, then we are going to start from 1, 2, 3, 4, then 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, less than 10. So we are not going to include 10. Then P is prime numbers. So P is a prime factor of 30. Prime factor of 30. So that means we should look at the prime factor of 30 and what does that mean? So if you think about 30, 30 can be expressed as a product of prime as follows, 3 times 10 and that is 3 times 2 times 5. So if these are the prime factors of prime factors of 30. So that means we can express this as 2, 3, 5. So the question says we should find the complement of P. So what is the complement of P? is a list of elements in the union set that you can't find in P. So if you remove all of these elements from the union set, you are going to be left with 1, then followed by 4, then followed by 6, 7, 8, and 9. So this is a complement of P, and that makes option C to be the correct option. So let's talk about the next question. The next question is question 35 from 2007. So given that P is equal to 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, and Q is equal to 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. So the question says that we should determine the relationship between P and Q. So the question expects us to look at the options and see which option is correct, basically, like which of which of the option is correct. Now let's look at the first option. The first option says that P intersection Q is empty set. This empty set. So let's try to see if that statement is correct. What is an empty set? Empty set means nothing, right? No element. Now this statement will only be true if there's no common element. There's no common element in P and Q. So let's investigate that. If you look at this, is there no common element in P and Q? So let's look at this. There is there one in P, in, one is not in Q, three is not in Q, five, seven, nine, eleven. So it appears this statement is correct because there is no element in Q that you can find in P and vice versa. So this option is a right option. But let's look at other options. Let's see if any of them makes any sense. So option B is P. This is subset. This symbol is subset, less than symbol, subset Q. So what this symbol is saying that is P a subset of Q. Now from what we learned, you can say P is a subset of Q if all the elements here can be found in this Q. And that's not the case. We can't find all these elements in Q. So that is wrong. So look at the next option, which is Q is a subset of P. That is also wrong because all the elements here, they can't be found in P. You can't find all of this inside P. So that makes this option to be wrong. Then the fourth option, which is P equals Q. So this is wrong because they are not equal. They don't have equal 
elements. They say they, they don't have equal uh, uh, same elements. They don't have the, the same elements. So if you check, this is this is there's no they don't have the same elements. But then if the question has been okay, let's count one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Assuming that they said something like this, then this is correct. Now the difference between this statement and this statement, this means equal set. This is saying are these two set equal? Meaning do they have the same items in this two sets? So which is wrong? But this is correct because this means cardinality. So this n means what's the number of elements in P? What's the cardinality of set P? What's the cardinal number of set P? What's the cardinal number of set Q? If you count the number of elements, cardinal number means number of elements is six. Number of elements here is six, so it's, they're the same. So this would have been correct if they had used this symbol, but then this is what they use. So it means the only right option is option A. So we're going to solve one more question. And that's uh, question 11 from 2010. So in this question, we have universal set to be x, and x is within this range. Set can be expressed as this. So what this means is, what this symbol means is, x ranges from 1 to 30. And when you see this equal sign, it means inclusive of 1 and 30. So basically, what this set is saying, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 30. So that's basically what the universal set is. Then set P is Y, which consists of multiple of 5. So multiple of 5 from 1 to 30 is as follows. So multiple of 5, excluding, since we are starting from 1 to 30, multiple of 5 will not, we are not going to include 0 because 0 is not part of the universal set. So we are going to start from any number from 1 to 30. So the first multiple of 5 will be 5 followed by 10, 15, then 20, 25, then 30. Then multiple of Q, that will be even numbers, even numbers within this range, within this range. So that will include things like 2, 4, 6, up to 30. Mind you, is this will not include all numbers from 2 to 30, it's just the even numbers. So the question states that we should look for P intersection Q. Intersection means what can be found in both P and Q, right? Now let's think about it this way. So what can we find in P and can also be found in Q? Since these are even numbers, it means the only number we should be interested in should be numbers, even numbers in P that are even numbers of course, all of these are even numbers, so we're going to be we're going to extract even numbers here because these are the numbers that you can find in Q. So here they are. Ten is an even number, and it's also an even number here. Twenty, twenty, then thirty. So these are the this is the union, this is the intersection rather. So that's a set that can be found in set P and Q. The element that can be found in set P and Q. And that makes option C to be the correct option. So these are some of the questions related to sets. And um, this brings us to the end of this segment. We will continue sets uh, theory or sets in mathematics. We'll continue this concept in the next video.